face during the quarantining and all of that. I was just experimenting with facial hair, so please forgive me. But um, I was actually supposed to come to the building, um, I think in March, and that was right when things were, that week I think was when everyone started to lock down. So I appreciate this opportunity to be able to speak with you again. Uh, it's much delayed and of course very different than any of us had ever anticipated. But this is the topic that I was gonna share um, that time. So I'll do that now. I'm gonna share my screen. I have uh, slides of the different people that we'll be talking about today. Okay. And specifically, uh, Jewish women pioneers in the American West. Okay, I just so, made you a co-host, so you should be able to share. Okay, great. Let me give that a try. Perfect. Okay, so pioneer Jewish women in the American West. I hope you can see this okay. We'll be discussing seven very interesting women. museum as well, the Jewish Museum of the American West, which is a website. So you can, um, should have put the, the website here, but it's very simple, jmaw.org, jmaw, Jewish Museum of the American West, dot org. Um, on that website, you will find roughly 600 different um, exhibits, as we call them, featuring remarkable Jewish people who um, made their mark in the American West, the Western states, from the mid 19th century to the early 20th century. So we'll talk about some of these figures today, specifically women. And this is a, a period that historians call the new woman. Uh, the period of the new woman was a term used at the end of the 19th century to describe women who were pushing against the limits which society imposed on them. Pioneer women valued self-fulfillment and independence rather than the stereotypically feminine ideal of self-sacrifice. They believed really ahead of their time in legal and sexual equality. They were generally well-educated and read a great deal and were typically of the middle or up, upper middle class. These women are considered proto-feminists for their advocacy of women's independence and professional aspirations and had a major impact on the feminist movement of the 20th century. So we'll be looking at seven of these Jewish women today. Um, some of them I think you'll find quite remarkable. They were doing things in the public sphere years and years, decades really before other women will be recognized for doing that same thing. A great example is Julie Eichberg Rosewald, who was, in fact, the first woman to serve as a cantor in a synagogue. And this was all the way back at the end of the 19th century. So Julie Rosewald was born in Stuttgart, Germany in 1847. Her father, Moritz, was a cantor in the city and along with his wife, Eleanor, they raised a rather musical family. Julie's vocal abilities were identified at a young age, and she was enrolled at the Stuttgart Conservatorium. She came to America when she was about 17 years old, where she joined her sister, Pauline, who is a piano teacher in Baltimore, Maryland. In 1866, Julie Eichberg married Jacob Rosewald, a renowned violinist and composer. The couple frequently performed in Baltimore's Jewish community. Julie Rosewald was active in opera for the next 20 years, including a stint with the Kellogg English Opera Company, a European tour, and a prima donna role in the Emma Abbott Company under the direction of her husband. In 1884, the Rosewalds moved from Baltimore to the comparatively mild climate of San Francisco, 
primarily because of Jacob's failing health at the time. Julie planned to retire from the stage and to teach singers involved in the city's thriving opera and concert scenes. But something really unprecedented occurred in August of 1884. The cantor of Congregation Emmanuel, Max Wolf, passed away and the congregation needed a quick study to conduct the fast approaching high holiday services. The Progressive Temple hired Julie Rosewald to serve as its cantor, marking the first time on record that a woman led synagogue services in the United States. And in fact, the next time that we will find a record of a woman doing that role is not until 1955. So this is way earlier than historians typically acknowledge. Though she was not officially trained as a cantor and cantorial school didn't open up to women until the 1970s, Julie Rosewald served Emmanuel until 1893 and she was called in the community cantor soprano. In that capacity, she directed choir rehearsals, collaborated with the organist, made musical selections and sang solo parts during services. That is to say, she served as what a cantor would have been doing in those days. So we ask ourselves, um, first of all, why don't we know more about Julie Rosewald? She actually does appear in some texts, uh, some uh, of historical documents dealing with women involved in opera. And sometimes there's an acknowledgement that she sang at Congregation Emmanuel. But it really wasn't until about 10 years ago that a colleague of mine, Judy Panolis, uh, finally did significant research to uncover the reality that Rosewald actually served as a cantor. She was basically hiding in plain sight. So why was she able to do this? There are essentially five reasons for it. First was, as I mentioned, she learned Hebrew. She learned how to chant the services from her father, who was a cantor. Second reason is she had a classical music background, which in those days in the reform movement, such as Temple Emmanuel in San Francisco, this was very valued. So she sang the kind of music that they wanted to hear. A third reason is that she had some engagements in Baltimore before coming to San Francisco, uh, where she was able to sing uh, for Jewish groups, singing Hebrew songs, singing Yiddish, etc. And a fourth reason is that Emmanuel itself as a synagogue was quite forward thinking and a rather young congregation as well. And in California, there weren't the same strictures that there were elsewhere. So the idea of a woman singing on the bima was not such a big deal in a very progressive city, which was used to this sort of experimentation. And then finally, as I mentioned, this was also part of the new woman movement uh, in the late 19th century. So she would serve at the congregation from 1884 to 1893, almost 10 years, until another very esteemed cantor, Edward Stark, uh, began, became, uh, became the, um, the cantor there. And Julie Rosewald then moved to Mills College where she taught music. So she's one of these remarkable women, doesn't get enough credit. And that will be a theme running through all of these biographies. The next is Ray Frank. Um, this may not be a name that you're familiar with, but Ray Frank was equally amazing in the sense that she basically served in some rabbinic roles before, long before women were allowed to do so officially. Ray Frank was actually born in San Francisco to Polish immigrant uh, parents in 1861. As a young woman, she taught Bible and Jewish history at the religious school of the first Hebrew congregation in Oakland. And her students, by the way, included a budding author by the name of Gertrude Stein. Sure, some of you are familiar with that name. 
and also Judah Magnus, who in San Francisco is um, honored by the, Ju the Judah Magnus Museum, who's also a prominent uh, reform rabbi. So at uh, First Hebrew Congregation in Oakland, Ray Frank honed her skills as a public speaker and made a name for herself within the uh, California Jewish community. She worked as a correspondent for several San Francisco and Oakland newspapers and was a frequent contributor to a number of national Jewish publications. In the fall of 1890, while visiting Spokane, Washington, uh, she was invited to deliver a sermon, if you can believe it, on the eve of Yom Kippur. The impassioned sermon she delivered made a deep impression on the audience, which comprised both Jews and non-Jews. This was the first recorded uh, instance of a Jewish woman preaching formally from a pulpit in the United States, and it inaugurated Ray's career as what she was called the girl rabbi of the Golden West. Despite Frank's insistence that she had no interest in becoming a rabbi formally, she uh, did force American Jewry at the time to seriously consider the possibility that a woman could play the role of a rabbi. For example, in April of 1897, she was invited to conduct Passover services at, Stock at Stockton, California's Rahim Ahuvim, which was later renamed Temple Israel. Tensions were flaring at the time at that synagogue between the reform uh, members and the Orthodox members, and Frank was called in to help restore the peace. And her efforts were highly successful. And the temple's president, supposedly, the record is unclear, but the story goes that he actually asked her to become the rabbi of the synagogue, which of course infuriated the Orthodox faction. And of course, also she said she didn't wanna be the rabbi, so that sort of got the uh, president off the hook. But Frank spent much of the 1890s traveling up and down the West Coast, giving lectures to B'nai B'rith lodges, literary societies, and synagogue groups, speaking in both reform and Orthodox settings, giving sermons, officiating at services, and even chanting Torah. So how did this happen? Again, the newness of these Jewish communities in the West likely contributed to Frank's ability to do what she did. Had more established Jewish institutions and well entrenched Jewish leaderships uh, existed in the area, Frank might never have been given the opportunity to become the girl rabbi of the Golden West. Now we move into somewhat more familiar territory. That is the role of women as teachers during this time. In the 1890s, there was a movement toward universal education and a formalization of the education process in the United States, moving away from the small community schoolhouses and into the public school model that we find today. During this time, there were a multitude of social and institutional reforms as cities began to industrialize. And by 1850, women began to play a larger role in primary education, which up to that point was really the role of men in American society. So the drive for universal education increased the number of schools, which in turn increased the demand for teachers. In the 1880s and the 1890s, teaching was one of the few careers then considered suitable for daughters of the Jewish pioneer families in the West. In the urban areas of California, such as Los Angeles, uh, many of the young ladies prepared themselves for a career in education. The Jewish press reported on the 1894 graduation from the State Normal School in Los Angeles of Mina 
and Esther Norton sisters. The LA Normal School, by the way, uh, which by the, the term normal school meant a school that taught teachers, this school in Los Angeles would grow into UCLA, actually, uh, in 1919. According to family lore, one of Mina's students was Leo Carrillo, the celebrated actor and conservationist for whom Leo Carrillo State Park in Malibu is named. And Mina's first position was at the newly opened Santa Monica Canyon School, this small uh, frame building that you see here. She's standing, if you can see her, uh, next to a small boy um, near the door of the, the school. That is Mina. So Mina Norton remained at this Santa Monica Canyon School for about a year and then taught in Los Angeles from 1895 until the summer of 1903 at the Ann Street School. So not only is this an interesting picture because it depicts uh, school in those days, but that is Santa Monica in the late, or I should say in the 1890s. Here's another very important Los Angeles contributor, Sarah Vassen. Sarah Vassen was born in Quincy, Illinois in 1870. She was one of nine children. So she was constantly exposed to her mother's seemingly perpetual pregnancies and child rearing. She decided at the age of nine to pursue an interest in gynecology and obstetrics, which was then very uncommon for women to pursue. After graduating high school, Vassen studied for two years with Dr. Melinda Napscheid German, who was one of the first female doctors to practice medicine in Illinois. In 1890, Vassen entered medical school, and uh, this was at the Keokuk uh, College of Medicine in uh, Iowa, and she was the first graduate, the first female graduate, I should say, from this co-ed medical school in March uh, of 1892. In 1897, she enrolled in postgraduate training in obstetrics in Philadelphia and became superintendent of the city's Jewish maternity house. In 1904, we find Sarah Vassen, Dr. Sarah Vassen in Los Angeles where she became a physician and supervisor at Casper Cohn Hospital, which was a forerunner of Cedar sinai Medical Center. She was the hospital's first superintendent and the first Jewish woman to practice medicine in Los Angeles. She devoted her medical career to the underprivileged in the Jewish community, specifically the women and children, and as a resident of Glendale, helped organize a religious school uh, for the city's Jewish children. Sticking with the theme of medicine, another very important woman whose name is uh, often lost in the historical record, Elizabeth Fleischmann Ashheim. Elizabeth Fleischmann Ashheim was born in 1859 in El Dorado County in the gold country of California. Though virtually unknown in the annals of American Jewish history, she was recognized as a martyr to the new science of radiology. You can see her in the picture on the right um, with a very primitive x-ray machine. In 1894, Elizabeth Fleischmann Eichheim, Eichheim rather, uh, was encouraged by her brother-in-law, Dr. Michael Wolf, a San Francisco physician to enter the new field of x-rays. In 1896, Elizabeth opened the first x-ray laboratory in California. Wounded soldiers who had been in battle in the Philippine Islands during the Spanish-American War were brought to San Francisco and Elizabeth took their x-rays. The San Francisco Chronicle at the time observed that she became indispensable to the army physician, or sorry, to the army physicians. Unfortunately, she was so intent in performance of her work 
that she became careless of her own health. In 1905, X-ray burns on her right arm necessitated its amputation, and she never fully recovered from this and died seven months later of radiation poisoning at the young age of 46. And that is why she's known as a martyr to the field of x-rays. We now come to another very important woman. Um, sorry, I think I might have skipped one. No, I didn't. Okay, Flora Langerman Spiegelberg. Flora Langerman was born in New York City in 1857. When Flora was two months old, her mother took her to San Francisco, where her father, Colonel William Langerman, was a distinguished officer in the California State Militia. After her father died in 1866, Flora and her mother returned to New York. By 1869, they had moved to Germany to further Flora's education. Five years later, Flora Langerman met and married Willie Spiegelberg in Nuremberg. Willie was a junior partner in the Spiegelberg Brothers Mercantile Firm, making around $50,000 per year, which was an enormous amount of money in those days. In 1875, the Spiegelbergs arrived in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, where Flora brought her middle-class European style to the West. She worked to create the Santa Fe Academy, the first non-sectarian school for girls in the city. She purchased an adobe building and hired a teacher for the 12 Jewish and Protestant pupils. In the early 1880s, she expanded to a three-room schoolhouse complete with a playground and a garden. And there, Flora taught sewing, needlework, gardening, and nature study. She also kept close ties to the Santa Fe Catholic community, conducting two religious schools, one on Saturday for Jewish children and one on Sunday for Catholic children. In the late 1880s, Flora and Willie Spiegelberg returned to New York, where many members of the Spiegelberg family lived. While in New York, Flora founded the Boys Vacational Club and the inaugural Jewish Working Girls Club. And the last woman I would like to talk about is Amelia Dannenberg. In the 19th century, in the American West in particular, very few women were engaged in business or industry. We've discussed women who served in clergy roles and as teachers and in the medical profession, but business and industry was really a man's world. Other than school teaching, gainful employment for female members of Jewish families was considered socially unacceptable. Such engagement uh, was seen as perhaps advertising the inadequacy of the male breadwinner. So enter Amelia Dannenberg, who was born in the Rhineland region of Germany in 1829. By the 1860s, she was importing and manufacturing embroideries and infants furnishing goods in San Francisco. Her status as an independent businesswoman and as a manufacturer of children's wearing apparel was unique. Her husband, Joseph Dannenberg, merchandised products from Amelia's factory and materials that she imported. In the American Israelite of Cincinnati in 1869, this was a, a national Jewish weekly of the reform movement, it was noted that Mrs. Amelia Dannenberg had won a diploma at the San Francisco Mechanics Fair for some of the baby clothing she had manufactured, recognizing the very, high, the very highest quality of the products she turned out. By the 1870s, she was engaged in manufacturing and importing ladies' suits and cloaks, as well as children's clothing. Amelia Dannenberg is considered one of the first, if not the first, true Jewish woman entrepreneurs in the American West. 
So we could talk about other women as well. I decided to focus on seven this afternoon. And um, as you noted, these women served in various fields, uh, certainly made contributions in areas that were not necessarily open to them uh, by design, but it was their own fortitude, their own education, their own will, and their own interests that allowed them to pursue these things that were really, as I mentioned, sort of manly um, professions at the time. Many decades earlier, uh, really a century earlier in some cases, than the women's liberation in the United States. So I wonder um, if we can perhaps have a conversation. I don't know how um, fluid such things can be, maybe questions and answers, that kind of thing on, on this Zoom format. But I wanted to leave time for you to perhaps reflect, share stories, that kind of thing. But I do have a question. I, I wonder what's the lesson that we might learn from, from these women? Certainly, they're interesting. And as a historian, I find these little stories to be quite telling, not only about uh, Jewish people and the Jewish presence in the West, but the ability of women that was really there all the time, um, but was often sort of submerged in society. So are there any lessons that we can draw from these women other than just being proud that they even existed? Any ideas? My, I hear, my, yeah. my, my thought was that like women of those, that period, that general period everywhere, they were ignored. Their, their story wasn't told. Their history wasn't uh, found and, and, and presented. Uh, and just, and uh, so the Jewish women who did these good things, nobody knew about them and, and uh, uh, it wasn't unusual. Um, I saw an exhibit at, uh, uh, it was in New York City on, on women, uh, I think from patio to politics or something like that, uh -huh. and told about uh, Hannah's old and, and the rise of uh, the Hadassah, I think I've got that straight, and, and several other women who were very important in kindergartens and sanitation and all that sort of thing. But their, their history was uh, suppressed. So it wasn't just Jewish women, as of course you know, and, but it's wonderful to have the Jewish women. Sure. Forth, uh, at this time, and I discovered, um, uh, okay, a uh, Belle Weinstein of um, uh, Montana who worked for Jeanette Rankin, and I learned about her very recently as we did were doing the um, the things for our uh, centennial of uh, of suffrage, and uh, I could uh, identify with her <laughs> and just loved her. So I I'm thrilled to know that these women existed, and the more I know about, the better I feel about about them. But we weren't the only ones who. Oh, absolutely. It has to be just it has to be discovered. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was a certainly um, when we look at Jewish history in general, um, it's I think easy to sort of decontextualize. You know, look at looking at our history as something that existed, perhaps um, apart from or in isolation from the rest of society. But certainly, um, this is just a Jewish Jewish examples of something that was going on. There were remarkable women. Certainly um, a minority because of the, the social pressures of the day and the social norms of the day, um, you know, getting married and um, having children was still the main profession, so to speak, of women in those days. Um, I've also had the experience of even trying to find the first name of a lot of these uh, women in the West was very difficult because they were just Mrs. Herman Sachs or something like that, as opposed to even being recognized by their own names. They just adopted the first and last names of their, their husbands. So there were a lot of uh, barriers. And the fact that the, the new women's movement of the late 19th century, um, there were some cracks that were made, certainly some, some movements that were made by these typically middle-class women who were able to punch through uh, in certain areas, that is cause, I think, for celebration and recognition, because when we look at the history of, of the world, it's still, you know, the great men, as it were, and the women are ignored. And they were there. Uh, often, you know, we hear the cliche that, the uh, you know, behind every great man is a great woman. 
Um, oftentimes, the the man was only great because of the greatness of the woman. But that's a whole that's a whole okay. other story. We'll, we'll get you next year for that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you talk, if, if I can have another minute or two. When you talked about having difficulty finding their first names, uh, the uh, um, curator of photography at LA Public Library found fabulous photographs from a newspaper that had published in the San Fernando Valley from 19, I don't know, 40, I used to know the dates, 40 to 56 or something like that. It's not quite accurate. And uh, and found these women doing fabulous things uh, and, and put it into a wonderful, wonderful book. And she had a lot of research to find their first names, to, to find people who knew them, find articles about them that included their first name. But the newspapers always published us as Mrs. Gerald Pikus or Mrs. Uh, uh, Morton um, Richter or like that. And actually, when I became president of AAUW and when the LA Times had a section in the Valley, which even had a women's section. I called the editor and I said, we were going to start sending our names in with using our first names and not our husband's names. She said, you know, that's not socially correct. I said, well, you know, we're not a social organization. <laughs> and, uh, and I began to do that. And it took about more and more common. And now even when you go to the, they list the members of the board of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and the LA Opera and such, the women pretty much use their first names. It took a yeah. while for that to happen, but there has oh, been. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was. I think they led the charge. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's that. really wonderful that you did that. And it wasn't really until, you know, post 1970s that it became the norm for women. That's exactly. to, it was, it was about 1970 that, that I became president of this organization and called them and told them that's what I was going to do. So it took a while after that, but eventually it, it did. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's wonderful that you did that. And it, again, it, it certainly makes the historian's job a lot easier when we can have first names and last names uh, for obvious reasons. But um, I think that's another thing that's so remarkable about these particular women that we talked about today. And again, there are seven of, you know, dozens and dozens I could have um, highlighted. Um, these women were by and large um, more well-known, more respected, more um, historically important than their husbands. And in fact, sometimes their husband's names, maybe as sort of poetic justice, are forgotten <laughs> from the record. So, you know, it's the little victories, right? Little, I, yeah. Thank you, Joy. Very interesting. Um, is there anyone else that wants to share any comments or feedback or questions? Go ahead and unmute yourself and I'll call on you. Just hit your little red microphone on Zoom or if you called in, you hit star six. Anybody, any comments? Looks like Evelyn is trying. Okay. Hi. Oh, Ruth, hello, Ruth. Yeah, I just uh, interested in the names. What I'm noting is that they're all German. Yes. And of course the first, uh, I think the first Jews that came were the well-to-do German Jews. And all the women you're mentioning are German. Is that correct? Or German oh, yeah. heritage? Yes. Yeah, so um, yes, uh, to the extent that you know they came from German-speaking areas. So um, part of it is just the time frame, like you're saying. Uh, certainly in the in the American West, the first, and even the the American general, the first real wave of European immigration from you know roughly 1820 to 1860 or so, um, and even trickling in after that, was German-speaking uh, Jewish immigrants. Then between um, the 1880s and uh, the 1920s was when we had that huge wave from Eastern Europe of 2.3 million Jews who all kind of filtered in and many of them, most of them stayed in the New York area. So when we're talking about the American West, you'll find even a larger proportion of um, the Jewish pioneers being German speaking. Now, there is a question, you know, what does German mean in this context? Because the state of Germany was not um, unified, it was not independent until 1871. So we're really talking about uh, people who came from German states or even parts of Poland that sp spoke Germany, even parts of France that, that spoke German. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, and 
it's a little more complicated than that. They were more ethnically diverse than, you know, monolithic in that sense, if that makes, if that makes sense. But yes, you're correct. Okay, thank you, Ruth. And thank you, Jonathan. Um, anybody else have something to share? Evelyn, did you have something to share? Um, but Evelyn, what you need to do, you tap your iPad so you see the icon come up at the top. You'll see a red microphone and touch the red microphone. There you are. Hi, Evelyn. You did it. Wow. <laughs> Great. Nice okay. to see you. <laughs> I have here a mug that I gave to my husband. It says, behind every successful woman, there's a man who's surprised. <laughs> uh, That's great. So, um, but you say that the men were not as, as famous as, as their wives, but they deserve some credit. They let their <laughs> wives do their thing. And yeah, I, absolutely. Absolutely. You're, that's a great point. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, as much as it, it's also true in the other direction that you would need a supportive spouse, the fact that these, these men were obviously rather progressive um, to even allow their, their wives to do these things that were seen as so socially abnormal at the time. That's a very, very good point. I appreciate that. I have an additional uh, thought. Uh, again, many years ago, there was an exhibit in Chicago, which is where I grew up, but this was long after I left it, come back for a visit. And, there, and there's visit, the, the exhibit dealt with Hull House, which was a famous settlement home uh, founded by Jane Addams. My mother was a great admirer of Jane Addams. She didn't know that the settlement cookbook, which I believe every Jewish woman of my age was given a gift when she got married, uh, that it was a fundraiser for Hull House, that it, the settlement mm -hmm. cookbook. I, and my mother never knew that, and I wish I'd been able to tell her. In any case, this was an exhibit about it, and they talked about some of the women who had worked there, who had worked with it, who had helped to found it, etc. And the woman who stands out to me was a woman with a very long Russian name and a very strong presence. And she, in the late 1900s, 1800s, 1897, something like that, she was an OBGYN. And I thought that was just totally amazing for a woman to be a doctor in those days, and especially an OB, because that was one of the last breakthroughs right. for women in, in our lifetimes. So I, I never forgot that. I didn't remember her name, only that it was a long, difficult Russian name. So yeah. it was, there were women who broke through, and uh, but lots of stories of the women who really cre created curbs and, 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 and uh, crosswalks and, and the kindergartens and all these safety features and, and um, uh, sewers and things, sanit sanitation and, and all, women, garbage collections. Women were fabulous. <laughs> it yep. took a long time before we learned about those things. So right. the Jewish women were forgotten. A whole bunch of other women were forgotten too. Yeah, and I, I think it's a great point that you mentioned with the settlement house movement, you know, which was really across the country. There was something like 500 or so. I forget the exact number. Settlement houses in major cities, including Los Angeles, there was the uh, neighborhood music settlement, which was in Boyle Heights, which was a music school. And a lot of these um, basically, these settlement houses were a way to Americanize immigrants and other uh, poor uh, populations into American culture. And they used music a lot, uh, music education as a way to do that. Um, but they were, you know, by and large, if not all of them run by really remarkable women who were very forthright, very, um, had a lot of will, were able to push a lot of things through during the progressive era. Um, I should mention too, I there are some wonderful um, kind of LA stories associated with this as well. Um, one of the things that uh, I find fascinating because I've done uh, a lot of personal research on the history of the Los Angeles Philharmonic is that before the Philharmonic was established around uh, 1919 or so, there were two kind of amateur orchestras in Los Angeles that were kind of halfway respectable. And one of them was the Los Angeles Women's Symphony, which was all amateur because the women were not allowed to make money. Um, they were, you know, encouraged to pursue music as a hobby. 
but they couldn't make money, even though for all intents and purposes, they were a professional orchestra. So ju just think how remarkable that is. You have a, an entire orchestra, maybe 80 people, I don't know, all women playing the masterworks of you know Western music. These kinds of images are really fascinating when we're talking about a period where, like you said, uh, certainly we don't recognize women as much as we should. Look how long it's taken for Title IX to have an impact, or for Title IX to be created and have an impact on athletics so that universities, which make ton of, tons of money in athletics mm. and support the men's programs, finally supported the women's programs. Now I guess all of them are going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, right. but there are women athletes who are fabulous athletes and need to be supported in the Olympics. Eventually. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, you're you're right. I mean, I don't want to pretend like we're uh, we've solved all the problems, but it is remarkable to look back in the past and see that women were doing certain things that um, you just are surprised to see. And mm -hmm. I think that was that's the main uh, point of of my presentation today. Mm -hmm. It opened up a lot of lot of information and good good information to all of us, so we can pursue it on our own. <laughs> yeah, and I again, I invite you to to visit our museum, jmaw.org, where you'll find wonderful stories of women and men, uh, <laughs> you know. But uh, search around. All of the western states are, and that is states west of the Mississippi, are represented. And like I said, we have uh, approximately 600 exhibits, so you can get lost there for a while. Um, maybe even discover some family members you never knew you had. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, does anyone have any final comments or questions before we let Cantor Jonathan ride off into the sunset? <laughs> <laughs> Going east, I think. <laughs> <laughs> This was a really wonderful presentation, very informative. Hi, oh, Sue, there's- I just, it's got nothing to do with this terrific uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. I just want to tell people, if they have a problem unmuting, all they have to do is press, it will do it also. And thank you, Jonathan, I thought it was terrific. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, Zoom is a little tricky. We all have to get used to it. Uh, but I appreciate the, the mutual support that I see in this community too. That's quite, quite wonderful. Yeah, we're, spe we're a special community and we're gonna celebrate Hanukkah on Zoom this year. I'm gonna cancel the spotlight. Yeah, we're gonna celebrate. We're gonna light the menorah on Zoom this year together. And we're going to kick off. We're going to have a klezmer solo clarinet player on um, Thursday. So that should be really nice. So happy Hanukkah, Cantor Jonathan. We look forward to having you back. You must have many, many talks, I'm guessing. Oh, sure. Yeah, endless. And I'd love to be there in, in person again. I had a really fun time when I visited. Um, seems like forever ago. But once things calm down and we can do that kind of thing again, we can maybe even shake hands and stuff like that. Who knows? <laughs> Hug. Wouldn't it be nice to be hugged? Yeah, that would be nice. The good old days when we could shake each other's hands, yes. So now it's just a virtual, it's a virtual wave now. So Take have care. a good night, everybody. Happy Hanukkah. Be safe. Thanks, thanks Cantor Jonathan. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lori, for bringing Jonathan to us. <laughs>